We met with Stephen Hawking and his daughter Lucy in his office at Cambridge University on Monday, February 25th. And here is that conversation. Stephen, thank you very much for allowing us to come here and visit you in Cambridge. Um, my first question is that in some ways you have said that your illness has been a blessing because it allows you to focus more resolutely uh, on what you can do with your life. What did you mean? I don't have much positive to say about motor neuron disease, but it taught me not to pity myself, because others were worse off, and to get on with what I still could do. I am happier now than before I developed the condition. You have also said that while you physically fit the part of a disabled genius, you personally don't believe that you're a genius in the same way that Einstein was. You know. How are you different? I didn't feel I should claim equality with Einstein, but in fact all physicists think in rather similar ways. Einstein wasn't that good at math, but had great physical insight and had the courage to think outside the conventional approach. I just hope I have a little of those qualities. You have thought deeply and written about the theory of everything. You once suggested that you hoped it could be found by the year 2020 or by the end of this century. Do you think that's a realistic goal? In 1980, I said that a theory of everything might be found by the end of the century. That is still my estimate, but there's rather more of this century left. <laughs> and others have said this to me, including Bill Gates, that they might be uh, more interested in going into molecular biology. When I started research, I didn't want to work on biology because it seemed hand-waving and descriptive and not to deal with the fundamental mechanisms. That didn't come until people began to work on molecular biology. But I'm glad I decided on cosmology. It is the most fundamental science of all, since it provides the setting and the laws for all the other sciences. You've also been weightless. You have expressed a desire to travel in outer space. You know, what would that experience mean for you when you think about how much of your own work has to do with space and black holes and how we perceive the universe. What would, what would going to outer space be as an experience? I want to go into space because I want to encourage man, or should I say, person, Space flight, because I believe that the long-term future of the human race must be in space. It will be difficult enough to avoid disaster on planet Earth in the next hundred years, let alone the next thousand or million. The human race shouldn't have all its eggs in one basket or on one planet. Let's hope we can avoid dropping the basket until we have spread the load. <laughs> what is it about Einstein and you and Marilyn Monroe? I think she preferred my dad. <laughs> <laughs> I have a photograph of her and me. Yes. Too bad it's a fake. <laughs> <laughs> Show it now. <laughs> Stephen, when I look around this office where you work, there is Star Trek. That's been a part of your life. The Simpsons has been a part of your life. Uh, selling 10 million copies of your book has been a part of your life. Um, despite all the struggle, it's been a great life. 
I can't complain. I am satisfied with what I have managed to do, despite the odds. You've also spoken about the role of art in our life, and one of your great loves in music was Wagner, you know. Why does Wagner make you feel a certain way? I was drawn to Werner, or Wagner, as my speech synthesizer pronounces him when I was first diagnosed with ALS and given about two years to live. His music expressed my mood at the time. Werner manages to convey emotion with music better than anyone before or since. Whenever we think about certain questions in science, we also think about religion and whether there is a life after death. And most scientists I know don't believe in a particular God. What is your view? Physicists believe that the universe is governed by scientific laws. These laws must hold without exceptions, or they wouldn't be laws. That doesn't leave much room for miracles, or God. I regard the afterlife to be a fairy story for people that are afraid of the dark. Uh, this is a book that you and Lucy, your daughter, have written called George's Secret Key to the Universe, uh, and, and it explains exploration into science from the, and we'll have Lucy talk about this in a moment. Before I ask the next question, Lucy, tell me how this book came up. Well, I had the idea for George's Secret Key to the Universe for various different reasons. I have a 10-year-old son, and I very much wanted to work with my dad to write something that would explain some of the work my dad's done for my son and for my nephew and for all the other kids who were coming up to my dad and asking him questions. I mean, my dad would come to my son's birthday party and appear kind of like the magician, and all the kids would crowd around him and start saying things like, so Stephen, what would happen if I fell into a black hole? Or Stephen, what would happen if I went for a walk on Jupiter. And my dad was giving the kids these really, really good answers. They were very clear, they were very funny and very informative. And the kids were absolutely hooked. But I also noticed that all the adults were gathering around as well and listening to the answers and then going, oh yes, I knew that. When clearly they hadn't really got a clue. So I thought people really are interested. They would, there are a lot of people who would respond very well to reading about some of these topics in an adventure story. And, and who are the characters in the adventure story? The characters are, there's a small boy called George, who's our hero. And George lives with his eco-warrior parents. So he's had this very um, techno-free childhood. But he's got this great curiosity and this great imagination, which, having grown up with physics and having grown up with a lot of scientists around me, I see that as the hallmarks of a scientist, is this great okay, imagination. Curiosity. And curiosity and this desire for knowledge. And the desire to ask questions and keep asking questions and to not be satisfied with answers. And, that's, and George is like that. And George is sort of a bit like my older brother as well, who, who, who is, a, I'm not a scientist, my older brother is. And there's a bit in the book where little George goes to a conference of scientists and he puts up his hand and he asks a question. Because I remember being told about my older brother accompanying my dad to a proper conference of professional theoretical physicists sitting in the front row, nodding the whole way through and then asking a question at the end when he was about eight years old. So that's George, our hero. And George meets his next door neighbours who are Eric, who is the world's greatest living scientist, and his daughter Annie. And Eric and Annie have this amazing computer called Cosmos, who's so clever and so powerful, he can draw a doorway through which you can walk to any Anywhere. part of the known universe right. that you want to visit. And so using, so George's Secret Key to the Universe is really the story of George's adventures, both on the planet Earth and when he walks through the doorway. And all of George's curiosity. And all of George's curiosity, yeah. Here is the book, right here. Um, you have said, and I believe this fervently, that you understand a child's curiosity because you, and we're both 66, you have a child's, you are a child. We all start off as children, full of curiosity and wonder. I still have that curiosity and wonder. That is what Lucy and I have tried to convey in our book, George's Secret Key to the Universe.
What's interesting about this is, for me, is that journalists have the same kind of curiosity. I mean, the science, all scientists I know, you know, think of research as of going on a journey, and, and there is a great curiosity about where that journey might take them, and so therefore, you know, their own curiosity, and when you ask questions about what's a university and what makes it work and why is it the way it is, and, and look for some theory of everything, you are simply expressing, you know, the curiosity of how do things come together. You once said that a complete understanding of the universe, why it is as it is and why it exists at all, is your goal. How close are you? During my lifetime, we have come a long way towards understanding the universe. We now know what will happen in all but the most extreme conditions. But we can't yet claim to have a complete understanding. So the quest that has intrigued and inspired generations continues. The question of why the universe is. Talking about understanding the universe, you have said that there could be shadow galaxies, shadow stars, and even, even shadow people. How could this be possible? In some models of the universe, we live on a brain, a surface in a higher dimensional space. There can be another brain a short distance away. This is called a shadow brain because we can't see it, but we would feel the gravity of matter on the shadow brain. As I said, there could be galaxies, stars, and people on the shadow brain, and all we would know about them would be their gravitational effect on our universe. We are now talking about an area in which you made tremendous contribution to our understanding of the universe. You said recently that black holes aren't the eternal prisons they were once thought to be. How would you describe today the present notion of a black hole? It was once thought that when something fell into a black hole, that was it. Nothing could get out of a black hole, not even light. That is why they were called black holes. But then I discovered that the uncertainty principle of quantum theory would allow particles to leap slowly out of a black hole. So things can get out of a black hole. They are not eternal prisons. Or for human beings as well. Maybe. <laughs> Depends on the human being. <laughs> You wouldn't look good when you came out. <laughs> Going to either lofty or not so lofty ideas, you once said that the work of physics, after the discovery of this grand unification theory, sort of the theory of everything, would be like mountaineering, climbing a mountain, or climbing Everest, mountaineering after Everest. What did you mean? I would have thought it was fairly obvious what I meant. <laughs> if we ever do find a complete theory of the universe, it would be a great triumph of human reason, but it wouldn't leave much for us to do. We need an intellectual challenge. This is a yes or no. It would be the greatest achievement of science since Einstein's theory of relativity. Yes. Thinking about this universe that you think about, what worries you the most about the future of the universe? I am not worried about the future of the universe. The universe will continue whatever happens. But the future of the human race and of life on Earth is much less certain. We are in danger of destroying ourselves by our greed and stupidity. You have said that humanity's ultimate survival then depends, depends on colonizing the solar system. It has taken about four billion years for life on Earth to develop to the present stage. During that period, the main threat has been from collisions with comets every few million years. But now the man-made dangers to our survival are much greater and ever-increasing. 
If we remain confined to planet Earth, sooner or later we will destroy ourselves. The only long-term survival plan that works is to spread out into space. The sooner we start, the better. Do we need to do it, yes or no, by the end of this century? It would be a good idea. What are we not doing to prevent these disasters that we absolutely should be doing? Not acting don't sufficient urgency about climate change. You think we will survive? Maybe. I hope so. You once said, and just tell me whether you said this or not, that there's nothing, nothing like the eureka moment of discovering something and that it's different than sex <laughs> because it lasts longer. <laughs> Did you say that? Yes. <laughs> and you meant it. I know. <laughs> I'm going to go to Lucy for a moment. Um, how has he changed for you? Well, in the past few years, our relationship has changed because we've been working together. And that's been a lot of fun. And that's allowed me to see a different side of my dad because I've been working with him, even at the level that I was able to access it in physics. And that was a great privilege for me because I was able to see what my dad's like at work. In, this, this in working on this book, yeah. on, on, on George's Secret Key to the Universe. And I really enjoyed that because I got to see how clear-minded he is, what a huge encyclopedic amount of information and knowledge he has inside his mind, and um, how quick he is in his thought process and how he can put different things together and they fit. So that was very interesting. So that changed our relationship, although I expect he was always like that. Um, I, I suspect he's always been like that throughout his career. I think he's probably mellowed as he's got. And probably had to climb out of some black holes too. He's climbed out of some black holes, um, he's travelled around the universe, he's been on a zero gravity flight, but the one thing that hasn't changed about him is he has not slowed down at all. He still has a schedule that was really quite daunting. Um, he's just been to Chile and to Easter Island and now he's back and then he's off to the USA and so he's still got all his projects on the go and obviously he's off into space next on a real spaceship, not unfortunately we don't have Cosmos the computer. We can't just draw a doorway and walk through it to any part of the known universe that we'd like to visit. That would be very handy if we did. It'd be very handy for research purposes. We'd be very popular. <coughs> We'd have a long queue of people wanting to go through our doorway. <laughs> I've been told, Stephen, that the weightlessness experience for you was extraordinary. Um, one of the great experiences of your life. Yes. Do you live with the idea that you may, as Charles Simonia has done and others, go into space? I hope so. One last question. Um, is there a word, determination, passion, will, that has enabled you to survive and to be the force you are around the world and to have people see in you a representation of the great quest to understand who we are and how we fit. I have just always done what seemed the obvious thing to do. That says it all. Lucy, thank you. Thank you, Johnny. The book, George's Secret Key to the Universe, Lucy and Stephen Hawking.